The clay Dave and the other early potters dug was ideal for their vessels, but the valley held another prized resource. In the early 1800s, a type of clay was discovered here, white as cotton and just as valuable, kaolin. So, across the river from the big city, economic expansion was fueled by the land once again. The resources just below its surface were giving American industry a foothold in the south. Colonel Thomas Davies' pottery was located in Bath, actually it was located in a hill above Bath and next to the town of Kalen, which no longer exists. Uh, Colonel Thomas Davies made uh, fire brick mainly at this plant. He also made crucibles and uh, other things that were needed by Confederate industries. The workforce at the Davies Pottery included slaves from the last documented slave ship to evade naval blockades. The Wanderer, which had been fraudulently obtained from the New York Yacht Club, made national news when it was discovered that she had returned from the African Congo with more than 400 captives packed below decks, defying a federal ban on the importation of slaves. 170 of them were delivered to a steamboat woodyard at Sandbar Ferry. Undoubtedly, Davies had some of these wanderer slaves as proven by records that exist. One of the single most important items that they possessed, it's called a bayeri, and it's a bark basket, a woven bark basket, and on top is a crude face or head. Uh, the eyes and the teeth on this carved wood object have been outlined in white kaolin in Africa, and they consulted these before they planted or went to war in ceremonies. Um, the style of face jug that was made at Colonel Thomas Davies' pottery was, had never been seen before at any of the other potteries in this area. A man who saw the wanderer slaves wrote, three dozen Africans, tattoos racing across their brows and sharpened teeth showing behind parted lips, their dark eyes as wide and unbelieving as those of the farmers and merchants staring at them. Right next door to Davies Firebrick Plant was Southern Porcelain Company. Founded by investors from Vermont, it was the maker of the only fineware china in the South. After the outbreak of the Civil War, the northern interest that owned the factory left this area. So Southern Porcelain Company became uh, controlled and owned by uh, Alexander Stevens, who was the vice president of the Confederacy. At this point, it looks like they went into production of uh, telegraph insulators, very crude objects that uh, enabled them to string wire very fast in the field and get uh, telegraph operations up and running. For many years, Josiah Wedgwood required hundreds of tons of kaolin mined from the ridge above Horse Creek to make his fine English china. In the mid-19th century, South Carolina was a society focused on cotton the growing of it, the selling of it, and the entire culture surrounding it. But heavy tariffs, passed by Congress in 1828 on the cotton trade, initiated an idea in Horse Creek Valley that would transform its character and its appearance forever. Why, planters asked, can't we keep our cotton here and manufacture our own cloth? One man rose to that challenge finally succeeding where so many others who had tried had failed. William Gregg is a man who, who was born in Virginia, comes down to, to Columbia, learns the, as an apprentice how to be a silversmith, then goes on to Charleston. And in Charleston in the 1840s, here's a man who is saying that South Carolina cannot remain an agrarian state. Gentlemen planters with financial interests in and around Horse Creek Valley were fascinated with the notion of owning a textile mill. They recognized that the skill of weaving, practiced for centuries by artisans, could be industrialized, providing great profits for investors like themselves. 
two famous political figures in South Carolina during his time, George McDuffie and James Henry Hammond, play into this story. McDuffie was a leading spokesman for the nullification movement in South Carolina, which is going to come to its climax in the early 1830s when South Carolina almost goes to war against the United States. Their first venture was the wooden Vaucluse mill, but the owners quickly learned just how easy it was for an employee to express discontent when it was burned to the ground in 1831. So it's a sort of a repetitive story of people with uh, interest in making money, I suppose, but not the willingness to, to put the time and effort into operating it, and perhaps just not enough knowledge. I mean, these, these were men whose, whose understanding of economics was basically you buy land, you plant crops, you buy slaves, you harvest, you sell. And uh, that was one thing that Greg had that they, these other men did not have. He had the, the interest and the willingness to actually move to that area, to live there, and to be involved in the day-to-day -day management of the Vaucluse Mill. Greg was a businessman with a clear vision of Horse Creek Valley as the textile manufacturing center of the South. William Gregg recognized not only the importance of the flowing water through Horse Creek Valley, but also the potential energy that could be captured from the falls. But William Gregg says, I don't know that much about textile mills and how they run profitably, so I'm going to go to where they do know how to do it well. In the summer of 1844, Greg set out on what he termed a tour of inspection through the manufacturing districts of the northern states. And so he goes to New Jersey and then on to Lowell, Massachusetts, where they do this thing well, and they are making money. And so he writes down in his diary, how long is the mill in Lowell? How wide is it? How much water power do you need to to power how many spindles to maximize the profitability of your operation. The mill would employ several hundred workers and would produce 14,000 yards of cotton cloth per day. And he creates the town of Graniteville. And he's looking for, what's his labor force going to be? 1840s, what's a labor force going to be? Wrong, not slaves. He wants what he calls the poor whites. He thought that the Mill Village would serve as a sort of a moral uplift opportunity for them. And this, is, this, this brings us back to his paternalism. It won't work unless we have a top-down managerial style that more or less forces these people who have never had anybody much tell them what to do and in fact who treasure their independence. They may not have much in terms of the world's goods, but they, or at least they're on their own. Uh, they're ignorant, they're not well educated, and they're on sort of a dead-end street in terms of their, their life pattern. He's going to rescue them from this. Beginning in 1846, a mill emerged from blocks of blue granite mined at the nearby quarry. And then he builds the community and he builds houses for his workers, and he builds churches, and he builds parks, and parks with fountains, and, and all these amazing things for his workers. And then he says that his workers' children, from the ages of six to 12, are gonna be in school. It's a compulsory school system, and what he's doing is he's saying that if your child is caught truant from school, I'm gonna take you off the line, I'm gonna fine you, and if it happens too often, you're going to lose your job. That's called parent responsibility. Wow, that's different. Whereas uh, in other mills, uh, both in England and, and on, on this side of the ocean, uh, uh, children as young as eight, maybe even younger, were working. So he was progressive to that degree. But what he's doing is brilliant because he knows when these children turn 13 and are out of school, they're going to work in this mill and they're gonna work there probably for the rest of their lives. And if they know how to read and write and add and subtract before they even come into his mill, they're gonna be able to read instructions, they're gonna be able to count stitches, they're gonna be able to, they're gonna have a safer mill, and he's gonna have better production. By the fall of 1849, 
More than 300 mill workers were employed at Graniteville, and the town's population topped 900. For the next decade, though cotton decreased in price, Graniteville thrived, and its residents became company people, committed to the mill life, fiercely loyal to their community and like everyone else at the time, bracing for a civil war. William Gregg, he's not for the war. He is not for secession, like a Robert E. Lee, like a Alexander Hamilton Stevens, like a lot of people that it's still their state that they live in, that they come from, is important to them. One of the cloths the Graniteville Mill produced was of a coarse weave commissioned by the Confederate States of America for their army uniforms. At the same time, the Bath paper mill, which had been built before the war, was called upon to produce the paper for Confederate currency. On April 3, 1863, there's a fire in the Bath paper mill, and the place burns. We have articles from the Dallas newspaper, from the Memphis newspaper, from other newspapers throughout the Confederacy, saying that they're going to be shutting down or they'll go to maybe a half-page paper until they can find another source of newspaper stock because there was a fire in the Bath paper mill in South Carolina. If you look at printed materials in 1864 and 1865, a lot of that is on the back of wallpaper because there is no other source they can find for newspaper stock. So the Bath Mill has tremendous, tremendous impact on the, the Civil War because remember, newspapers are the, really the only source of information. In February of 1865, Sherman issued orders for all the mills in Horse Creek Valley to be destroyed. Confederate General Fightin' Joe Wheeler saved the mills by leading his men in a fierce battle fought on the streets of nearby Aiken. By April, the South had lost the Civil War and emancipation finally came to the enslaved. Although the New South was slow to adapt to the changes, William Gregg envisioned a future of growth and renewal. Despite his optimism, fate dealt him a different hand. In September of 1867, while directing the repair of a breach in Flat Rock Dam, Gregg contracted a fever and died. The end of the 19th century witnessed the creation of new mills throughout the valley. With Graniteville as the anchor of what became known as the Upper Valley, yet another mill was built on the old Vaucluse site. In time, it was followed by the Warren Mill on the other side of the creek. The Lower Valley welcomed the Langley Mill, several more mills in Bath, and the Clearwater Finishing Plant. Each one had its own village. Gregg's utopian dream slowly gave way to the new corporate ownership model emerging in the American textile industry. The independent mills were purchased by the United Merchants and Manufacturing Company of New York and the Seminole Mills of Florida. The mill companies did hold street control many times uh, over their employees. Uh, they gave the people you know, quite a bit of freedom, even though we had the company stores, which everybody owed their soul to, you know. <laughs> Housing was very cheap, and uh, you could rent a whole house, four-room house, for about $5 a month. And the, camp, the, the company maintained the house, maintained the streets, maintained the sewer systems, maintained the waterworks. The people, their allegiance was to that company. The mills of Horse Creek Valley intensified production to supply even more cloth during World War I. The Great Depression hit everyone hard. After the panic subsided, people began asking questions about the value of their work. By the beginning of 1930, union organizers assured mill operatives that their skills were crucial to their employers. Before long, 
the cry was repeated among mill workers, fair pay for good labor. And frankly, even when things hit rock bottom in the early and mid 1930s, the the, the, the Southern labor force was still deeply divided on whether unionization was the way to go. Roosevelt's New Deal offered a measure of hope, but operatives were caught in the middle. Rather than negotiate with union sympathizers, owners simply closed down the mills and hired armed guards to defend the perimeters from their own employees. The president of the Graniteville Mill was the local administrator of the New Deal program for the textile industry, which is sort of like the fox watching the hen house, to use the old cliche. Uh, as workers began to realize that, they became increasingly frustrated at the lack of change. They, they, they believed that Roosevelt meant things to change, was on their side, was working for them, but they didn't see it translated into policies on the local level. And this made them uh, much more receptive to the idea of a, a general strike. Soon, the whole world would read about the troubles in Horse Creek Valley when, in 1933, Erskine Caldwell wrote a book entitled God's Little Acre. It was an unvarnished look into a culture with which Caldwell claimed to be familiar and for which he had great empathy. Readers and critics were shocked and called the story indecent. For decades, Caldwell was forced to justify his publication and defend his gritty portrayal of his characters. He wanted Horse Creek Valley because he, he wanted uh, the reality of the shut mill. In those days, they just said the mill is shut. You know, and, and this is the little man trying to get the machine's going again, and we know how well that works out. Any controversy on the public's part or any resentment on his part always came when they implied that he wasn't writing about what he knew about. He, he knew very well what he was writing about, <laughs> and, uh, and he wrote about it very well. In 1941, the mills of the valley answered their country's call once again. After World War II, the mill villages were a mirror of America. Although communities were focused on progress, they also took time out to enjoy themselves. Baseball was very important to the mill villages. Every mill had its own baseball team. This is back during the teens, 20s, and 30s. And they would have their practice every Wednesday afternoon. You could go out and watch them practice. And then every Saturday afternoon, you would travel to one of the other mill villages for the big game of the week. And I remember as a youngster going out on a Saturday afternoon in these uh, clay sand ballparks and sitting on these rickety stands and chicken wire behind the home plate and watching the ball game. <laughs> in the last 30 years of the 20th century, new buildings were constructed. Avondale Mills purchased the original Graniteville Company in 1996. But eventually, in spite of the efforts of the mill operatives, the wheels slowed, the number of spindles declined, and the yardage decreased. One factor that I think helps explain the decline and demise of the cotton mill industry, the textile mill industry, even after the diversification that came along in the 60s and 70s with artificial fabrics coming in, and, and that sort of gave at least a temporary rejuvenation to the industry, uh, is the, that old uh, opportunity of outsourcing to Mexico to other Central America locations or worldwide to, to Southeast Asia, wherever it may be. Those planters who had so long ago believed they could run a mill with ease would hardly recognize what had once been a quilt of cotton fields and acres of longleaf pine forests. And people who had been raised in the mill villages of Horse Creek Valley hardly recognized their hometowns. They anticipated a recovery, but like William Gregg, fate had a different challenge in store for them. In 
At the same time the epic story of the mills was playing itself out by the waters of Horse Creek. A few miles away, the remnants of Henry Schultz's sleeping town of Hamburg were reclaimed by an entrepreneur, James U. Jackson. Like Schultz, Jackson also built a bridge. In 1891, he spanned the Savannah River to connect South Carolina to Georgia. But he wasn't aiming to compete with Augusta as Schultz had. On the contrary, Jackson intended to capitalize on his hometown's reputation naming his new town North Augusta, South Carolina. By the turn of the century, his Hampton Terrace Hotel was the largest wooden structure in the world and a luxurious winter destination for America's most influential businessmen and celebrities. Jackson adopted a transportation system that made it easy for his guests to travel from the Augusta train station to his hotel across the river. The trolley served two popular resort towns on either end of Horse Creek Valley, North Augusta on the one end and Aiken on the other. As you had on either end of this Mill Valley, you had some of the most powerful people in the United States, let alone the world, that came here for the winter months. Bing Crosby came down here to play golf. Fred Astaire came down here and spent many of his winters down here. Will Rogers came down here, wanted to play, learn how to play polo. John D. Rockefeller, Henry Ford, these are people that shaped American history. They came to this Horse Creek Valley area. Just like the rest of the South, the area remained caught in the grip of segregation. But for a while, Music built another kind of bridge in the valley. Palmetto Park and Pond, I find, is a wonderful, wonderful story. Two guys get together and say, and we're going to promote this area. They build the pavilion that can seat a thousand people. They have a barbecue area and they also have a pond. Starting on May 12th, 1932, you have the finest jazz musicians in the world, international stars, that are coming to North Augusta, South Carolina. It's part of what's called the Chitlin Circuit. You have Dizzy Gillespie, Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Earl Father Hines, Cab Calloway and the Cotton Club Orchestra. Alan Simpkins from Ham, the town of Hamburg. It's very interesting that it should happen, and it did happen in, in Aiken County. In the early 1950s, the construction of the Savannah River plant ushered in a new industrial age. Soon, businesses from around the world recognized, as had so many before them, the appeal of Aiken County and its resources. In the valley, the mills were struggling to survive. Yet even in the face of foreign competition, there was still hope. Always there was hope. I raised three children in Graniteville, and it was it was a homey community, quiet, peaceful. You could hear the trains in the distance and, and the steam off the mills at, on occasions, but it was still just a peaceful place for, to be. And I thought it would be a great place for my children. And after they grew up and I remarried, I wanted to go back to that nice, quiet, peaceful town. <laughs> What was your emergency? I think there's been a train wreck. Oh, God, I smell smoke. Okay, ma'am, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get some smoke in the building. Very early in the morning, we received a page train derailment downtown Granville, possible fatalities. 911, where's your emergency? Something's wrong with the train. I woke up, and now it just smells like, like, not gas, but like a bleach, big cloud has come over the ground. Um, I knew that the, the mill, the mills downtown in Graniteville were running a midnight shift and there would be a lot of people down there, not to mention a lot of people asleep in their beds. 911. Hey, that's chlorine. It's chlorine? Yes, ma'am, we got back. Where, where, where are you at? I'm in Rocktown. 
And when we opened our bedroom door to go out into the living area, uh, it was it was like somebody threw something at our face because our eyes started tearing up and our throats started closing up. Two Norfolk Southern freight trains collided head on on a railroad track running parallel to Hickman Street. When we left, there was a green fog out in the alleyway and uh, I knew that I had to get out of there. Uh, and you gotta remember, you know, these were three 90-ton tank cars with chlorine, and one of them had a hole in it and, and released the majority of that. The people in Graniteville are resilient. They're strong. They're a committed group of people. They've worked every single day. They take care of their families. They love God. They take care of their community and their neighbor. Because they had done it so often throughout their history, the people of Horse Creek Valley knew how to mend broken things. Just a few years before the train derailment, they'd worked together as a community to transform Langley Pond from a toxic waterway into something quite extraordinary. I think there were many polluters of, of Langley Pond. There was a sudden awakening um, of, of, you know, we need to protect them, the public better and identify these, these highly polluted bodies of water and, in, and even land. There was a, a, an immediate halt to polluting Langley Pond. When Atlanta was chosen in 1990 to host the Summer Olympic Games, Langley Pond was identified as a possible training site for rowing activities related to the games. Volunteers, not a contractor, of volunteers went out there in John boats with uh, chainsaws and lowered the water level and cut the stumps off so that when the water level came up, the, it, the, the whole course would be free of stumps. Since then, Langley Pond has welcomed top rowers from all over the world and serves as a natural venue for a number of other events. In the valley, the promise of spring always follows the challenges of a hard winter. While those who were lost will never be forgotten, once the grieving is done, backs straighten and eyes begin to focus on tomorrow. Uh, the train wreck brought about a lot of interest from a lot of people. And so, you know, out of a tragedy, some good things can occur. And so what we've been able to do in a partnership way is bring people and resources to bear on the federal, state, and local levels that I don't necessarily think we would have been able to facilitate without a tragedy occurring. The structures that once resonated with the constant clicking of looms and the endless rattle of spindles sit in silence like sleeping giants. More than a million and a half square feet of former manufacturing space waiting for a new life. It had survived for 150 plus years, but what are we gonna do for the next 150 years? And now is the time that we can be able to do that. And I'm probably gonna spend the next 15 years trying to make all of this stuff happen in conjunction with everybody else, so it's exciting. From ocean waves that once rolled over its sand hills to the paved roads that now run beside its winding waters, Horse Creek Valley has cradled the people in every era who have stopped long enough to know it. And it's the people who take the time and make the effort to listen closely to its stories who will shape the tales that are yet to be told about Horse Creek Valley. <laughs>